my name is Manu Chander. I am an associate professor of English at Rutgers University, Newark, and I'm um, really delighted to be introducing our fantastic speakers who will be discussing uh, the topic of neoliberalism's diversity roofs. <clears throat> Um, Vijay Prashad was uh, scheduled to give opening remarks, um, but hasn't been able to attend. Um, if he does make it in, he's coming in from Buenos Aires. Um, we can um, hopefully save some time at the very end um, and uh, invite him to offer some closing remarks instead. Um, but in the meantime, let me just say a few words about why we've organized this event and what the topics of neoliberalism and diversity have to do with Newark, Rutgers, and uh, the North American Academy more widely. Soily Smith, who I'll be introducing momentarily, and I have had many conversations in recent weeks about the need to get a conversation going about how neoliberal institutions consistently pit differently racialized groups against each other. Um, and how that serves the interest of the dominant or managerial class. This is nothing new, of course, uh, as the great Guyanese Marxist historian Walter Rodney showed in his History of the Guyanese Working People. The planter class across the Caribbean thrived precisely by creating racial tensions and competitions between black and brown laborers in the post-emancipation years of the 19th century. Those who controlled the means of production also produced, Rodney shows, uh, the stereotypes and slurs with which Afro-Guyanese and Indo-Guyanese characterized one another. The deliberate uh, encouragement of racial tensions then is nothing new, but it does take on a new form in neoliberal institutions that place differently racialized groups into competitive struggles for such resources as student programming and faculty lines, and then paper over this tactic with the pretty language of diversity and beloved community. The rhetoric of diversity and community, we should be clear, is a means of skipping over the fact that diversity and community are problems. Good problems, of course, problems that invite us to consider the ways in which we can join together in common struggle, but problems nonetheless. Neoliberal institutions, however, present diversity and community not as problems, but as solutions, as if the presence of black and brown bodies might magically make structural inequities disappear. Again, this is not a new strategy, nor is it one that is limited to Newark. It does take on special importance, though, at a campus once described by university administration as a diversity lab. It is only fitting then that Newark be the site of focus for a conversation about how different, differently racialized subjects might come together to refuse what we were calling uh, neoliberalism's diversity ruse. So with all that said, let me introduce the truly inspiring scholars, cultural producers, and activists um, who we've, we've assembled to uh, speak on this subject. Um, so uh, does Margaret join us yet? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, hi, Margaret. I'm not looking at a sea of faces. Margaret Stevens um, teaches history at Essex County College uh, and has published on the history of Black workers, the Caribbean, uh, and the communist movement. She's a veteran mom and revolutionary. Um, she didn't mention this in um, the remarks she sent to me, but um, her Red International and Black Caribbean, um, published by Pluto Press, is really a must read. Um, and I encourage all of you to, to get on it. Um, Samira Rhodes is a writer, poet, and activist. Um, from the way of Newark. Um, she's currently enrolled at Rutgers and graduated from Essex County College in 2020. Sarah Aladdin is a fiction writer and English teacher in training who completed her undergraduate studies at Rutgers Newark in 2021. Nuhu Asman Atta is an RUN graduate turned, um, as he says, uh, exhausted graduate student uh, in philosophy at Pitt. Finally, um, Soily Smith, um, who many of us in this room already know and um, admire, um, and who really took the lead uh, in making this event happen, uh, is a cross-border writer and organizer. She's in her fifth year of doctoral studies at Rutgers Newark, theorizing aesthetics of refuge in the Canadian context. And I will turn it over to her to start our conversation. Soily. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm really uh, very excited to be doing this and have everyone here. 
And I too, I uh, regret that, that Vijay hasn't been able to join us yet or maybe not be able to join us today. But um, I, I'm still very happy to have this conversation. It is a much needed conversation. Um, I would also like to thank um, the union for uh, creating this space and also allowing us to have to, to do this experiment as we're calling it. Um, I think that uh, it's, uh, as Kathleen had said before we started, um, it's really the beginning of a conversation not the end of one. Um, the, uh, I would also really like to thank Manu who has uh, not just through our conversations that we've been having, but just in general, been a super supportive uh, faculty uh, member and, and comrade as, as we move through this. So I'm, and also I would like to thank Kathleen Farley. When we were first bumping around ideas about this, um, she, she had been like, well, what about a freedom school? So um, we're, I'm very grateful to her for, for sort of sparking that idea. Um, I also think that I want to acknowledge that something that we're trying to do here is that we have people from across, uh, I guess what we would call professional levels of the university, right? We have students, we have alumni, we have professors. Um, and I think that that's really important as well as having uh, inter or cross-cultural conversation and multiracial conversation. I think that uh, too often we accept the silos as they are um, defined for us. And when we, what we really need is, is some level of solidarity. And I hope that that's the beginning of that. Um, what I would like to start with is a little bit about how we uh, started this event. And part of the discussion uh, came out of a alumni group that formed in response to something, uh, a set of, a circumstance around a professor at RUN called Saudi Abbas. And she's in the English department and around the denial uh, that the university did uh, for a retention offer for her. Um, it's sort of an unprecedented uh, denial. And uh, so colleagues wrote administration, uh, students or this alumni group got together to write to administration um, to at least emphasize Professor Abbas's impact on us and particularly her impact on young Muslim women at the school. Uh, and young Muslim women are who led the charge on the letter. Uh, all the letters appealed to what Rutgers Newark and Rutgers more broadly consider central to its image and operations, the concept of diversity. Uh, when the response to the student letter came, it was, thanks for caring about your professor. And that was sort of it. And then the denial came, we were left to wonder at the reasoning and how antithetical the decision seemed in light of the university's diversity speak. This is what started us having conversations, which led to bigger conversations about diversity and what it is said to be and then what it becomes in practice. Um, we talked about what diversity does or even can mean in the American neoliberal university as it exists under capitalism. Uh, some of the questions we asked is what are the differences between anti-racist fight back and diversity speak? which seems to be just that, a kind of speech. Uh, to the neoliberal university, are some diverse people more diverse than others? How much of what counts as diversity programming produces opposite or uh, in other words, racist effects? And how much of it is beneficial to what Manu had referred to earlier, but the divide and rule strategy. Racialized groups competing against each other for funding crumbs or access while there is growing animosity between racial silos and a culture of racist anti-intellectualism, all while the logics of racial capital that govern these uh, diversity funding initiatives remain intact. One thing that the alumni group has talked at length about is the sinking of resources into and the exclusionary practices of one of Rutgers Newark's shining diversity initiatives, which is the Honors Living and Learning College. Many issues, especially around the exclusion of South Asian and Muslim students, members of our group had brought to Chancellor Cantor when the program was first being launched, but to no effect. And uh, those 
issues have really only compounded over the years. So for example, just for people who are not familiar with the Honors Living and Learning College, um, one of the things, the requirements is that you live on campus to be in it. And uh, many of the South Asian students said, well, culturally, that's not really an option for us. Um, and then I kept thinking more about that. I'm like, okay, you have kids. Okay, you have other reasons you can't move on campus. So then you don't have access to um, this programming that also seems to be wrapped up in narratives around equity and diversity. So the problem as we see it is not that critiques of neoliberalism within the university don't exist, they do. Um, but when it comes to diversity, many of us keep our analyses to ourselves or in private because racism means we want and need resources to combat it. But what do we give up by withholding our questions and critiques from each other, especially from the left? Um, this is a really tough topic to broach. And also what do we give up by accepting the neoliberal university's absorption and distortion of our calls for anti-racism into, uh, Mani used the term pretty, I'll use the term cheery language and narrative that is increasingly corporate in its logic. So I'm hoping to use some of these questions that we've posed here as guides for our conversation, but I think we should start with the first, um, just some examples of diversity rhetoric or programming you've come across and how it has fallen short or been used to racist effect or what the difference you have noticed between programs that make claims around diversity and those that don't. If it helps, I can go first, um, but I would really love to hear from somebody else. I can start us off. So, um... I know that sometimes when we get into scholarly or academic discussions, the language can kind of feel lofty and far away from the people who are experiencing it. So when we talk about diversity at RUN, it's actually something that first year undergraduate students feel in their everyday lives on campus. So I graduated last spring and throughout my time at Rutgers, professors would often pose this question of what do you guys think about the diversity here? And we'd have to sit back and think about it and it's like, well, there are definitely a lot of people who are different from me on this campus, but we don't talk to each other. Um, so we refer to these groups as sort of silos. So like um, each group kind of separates and sticks to their own like um, ethnicity or cultural background, even joining clubs that, that match this background of theirs. And there was very little programming on campus or effort from administration to actually cross those backgrounds and have the different groups interact with each other. Um, and that was the main thing I noticed about the so-called diversity on campus. Um, does anyone wanna take it over for me? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, I think that's, I mean, me and Sarah and I have talked about this before too, but it's, it's really, if you are in sort of the classrooms, you see it and hear it and feel it a lot. And I hear it from students, especially, and I hear it in terms of that, in the terms of the kind of scramble for resources, scramble for call for, for scholarships, where it's like, you know, so such and such group got this, but our group hasn't got this and such and such group. And I, you just see it there and you go, this, this works really good for racism, <laughs> like having all of these racialized groups um, competing for these crumbs and then we could talk about administrative bloat and what people are paid so it doesn't seem like there's not resources there to provide for everybody but there is this scramble um i'm thinking too a little bit and and someone can jump in after me too but um part of that scramble and and part of what i mean by it benefiting so if we think of the honors living and learning college i just recently learned so they name their cohorts each year and in 2019, they named, the cohort's name was the PSENG STEAM cohort. And uh, for anyone who's not familiar or hasn't paid a gas bill in New Jersey, PSENG is, is the major energy company. And I, my little left instincts were like, huh, why are they do, like donating through their foundation to these diversity initiatives at the university? Turns out in 2010, they got in big trouble 
we're talking sued by the state, sued by the feds for uh, their coal plants poisoning and killing people in poor black communities. So they've started donating to diversity initiatives in STEM, um, particularly Har uh, Howard and Rutgers Newark for their two shining uh, examples. If you Google them now, you're gonna have a hard time finding that information from 2010 uh, because they have so flooded uh, the, I guess, search engines with all of their green initiatives, all of their diversity initiatives. But then I was thinking about what it means to have students who on the one hand are being asked and prompted as Sarah was about the meaning of diversity and about um, you know, their future as, as the, the shining stars of this laboratory while they are serving ultimately as part of the redemption narrative for a racist corporation. And I think that that's something I hope we can dig into a little bit more here. Um, and, and then also thinking a bit too about like diversity as narrative versus diversity as a felt experience. Cause I think Sarah was pointing to that too as well. Um, I can call on somebody next or we can uh, just rotate. Uh, Nuhu, do you have any thoughts? I mean, Maybe still I, collecting I, them? So I, I, so I guess we, we were talking just the other day about this particular issue with the um, 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 narrative, right? And, and I, I was discussing a, a completely different issue about um, college sports and how uh, um, um, Jonathan Holloway was recently talking about how what sells is narrative and that's what really matters. And it's, it seemed to me, right, I, I graduated just when the honors live and learn community was starting. I was in the honors college, right? And it seemed to me that um, the honors live and learn community was uh, definitely uh, had a, a sort of narrative sell, right? Even though the, even though at the honors college, I, I was a student in the honors college my whole time in um, uh, at Rutgers Newark. And I, I, it was for me, if, as, as I mentioned to you last time, it was for me sort of an island and sort of a sea of darkness. It was an opportunity to meet people from a variety of backgrounds. And we were taking all of these um, classes that forced us into the same space. And we had to talk about a, a very different experience. It was, it was really a fascinating experience to me. And I thought it was, it, if, if anything, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, as you mentioned, right? It's a sort of, um, this, it, it's not just a narrative of diversity, right? It was a, um, it was an experience, a true experience of diversity, and um, it, it it was it really struck me as really um, um, weird on the part of uh, university administration to pretty much start dismantling um, the honors college, right? Because essentially they found a better narrative, right? Even though I, I suppose whatever. Um, Whatever actual actual diversity you might have want, wanted to uh, promote was already present in the honors college. If anything, you probably wanted to fix it more, right? So there's that um, there's that gap between narratives and um, felt experience and the reality of diversity. And it, for me, it's it's been one of the central issues of particular concern in all of this. And yeah. I'm I'm still trying to think through a bit um, through what 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 the entire point of, uh, of that move is, but I guess it should be clear enough what it is. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm also hoping to, to hear too a little more from Sam, because Sam is someone who's done quite a bit of work on um, the racist housing practices in New York, uh, particularly around public housing and, and also around uh, police brutality. Uh, both of us have, have, have done some work in a, and Margaret too, uh, involving a, uh, a local family, the Rodwell Spivey family, who are experiencing um, probably the worst of, of uh, police, not just racial profiling, but then also the retaliation from the police in Newark. And, and part of what makes it hard to advocate for the family or to do anything is that when you have a quote unquote progressive mayor and when you have similarly to the university, a progressive um, administration, 
it gets harder and harder to point to and fight against the racism that they are fostering uh, or not interceding on or not doing anything about. And, and also when they push back against your fight back, when they silence your fight back against these things. So I would love to hear more from Sam about maybe if you feel any disconnect between some of the conversations um, about some of the conversations at the university around diversity and then also your experience of, of racism in, in Rutgers Newark or in Newark in general in the city. <clears throat> the biggest gripe I have with Rutgers is they promote this idea of diversity, but when it comes to the hiring stage, majority of the faculty doesn't reflect their viewpoints. Um, and as for my experience with racism in Newark, um, it's just so insidious because there's this belief that we have a just because we have a black mayor that we don't experience racism um, in the gentrification um, in the uh, racist housing laws um, that they practice uh, via redlining and um, well, let me backtrack for a second. Um, our mayor, for example, he uses his, he utilizes his um, power of celebrity and um, identity politics to promote this idea that we are progressive, but um, like you mentioned earlier, the um, Ryan Wells Spivey case, one of the tactics of gentrification is to terrorize the black working class. And they've been experiencing harassment as a result of them daring to speak out against um, the police and the mayor. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Oh, no, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I can jump in as well. Um, so part of, I've traversed a lot of different academic spaces and just spaces, period. Um, and so, you know, I guess I, I went to Rutgers as an undergrad and then, um, and so I experienced diversity in that context. Um, and then I came back to Newark and, um, and uh, with my PhD and came back to Essex County College. So it's a, I can see the difference in the way you guys are even talking about something like this versus how we would talk about it at my school um, because I go to a people of color school. So it's, a, it's not a different conversation but it's a different relationship to the conversation, right? So when you talk about the crumbs that they visibly throw you at an integrated institution, because you guys are at an integrated institution, that's the whole point. Rutgers is an integrated institution. The, the crumbs are more visible. Um, but when you are, when your school is the crumb, right? Essex County College is a crumb by definition, it is a crumb. Um, a lot happens, right? One thing that happens is that the students there and the faculty there, they almost without realizing it, internalize the concept of the fact that we're crumb. It just becomes normal. The fact that we get so much less, so much less resources, no new hires, whatever. And so I think that there is that, and that's what happens. That's just an analogy to what happens around the entire world with imperialism and the different stages of development of capitalism, right? It's just that you have whole regions of the world where, where people are just conditioned to, to, to understanding that they don't live in the metropole. And so it's just not the same situation. Um, Essentially, I at Essex County College, I deal with a people of color leadership that terrorizes people of color. Um, and you know, I always see it as as sort of the way um, you know the New York Times and all these bourgeois ideologues talk about corruption, corrupt corrupt governments, 
in the Caribbean and Latin America, Africa and Asia, they talk about corruption in these governments, right? And that's the way I see my school's leadership, just as this sort of corrupt operation. But corruption is, is corruption is what the weaker capitalists are guilty of. The, 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 the bigger capitalists aren't guilty of corruption because they create the game. They loan the money. So the corruption that they engage in is so embedded that it's not even seen as corruption. And so, you know, I look at and compare the dysfunctionality of Essex County College to the relative functionality of Rutgers, right? And the key point there is that the relative development of Rutgers is totally dependent on the underdevelopment of Essex County College. Um, the two can't be separated. Um, Essex County College historically was supposed to be the two-year institution that provided a lot of the remedial and intro courses that could then send students to Rutgers. And then just like any other capitalist business, Rutgers realized how much money could be gained by offering remedial courses and then went on over the past maybe 10 years and started offering remedial math and English courses, which is a direct impingement on the function of Essex County College. So now Essex County College loses students and funding because students can now go to Rutgers and don't have to go to Essex County College anymore because Rutgers now offers what Essex County College didn't. So we are talking about capitalist businesses that function as academic spaces. I mean, these are businesses and, and the commodity that they produce is capitalist education. And I think it becomes much clearer when we understand and talk about any element of the academy in the way. These are capitalist institutions and the commodity that they produce is capitalist ideas. That's what they all produce is capitalist ideas and degrees that allow people to participate in a capitalist society. So Essex County College produces degrees and ideas that allow workers to enter into capitalism at a very basic level of employment. Rutgers produces middle managers and Harvard produces the ruling class. So that and diversity functions within all of those levels, right? But in all of those levels, the, the, the space is there to reproduce capitalist relations whether it is with people of color or white people. So I've said a lot, but that's really sort of how I would navigate Essex County College's relationship to this conversation. And just lastly, you know, when Essex County College in the 1980s did finally put a black president in, he came in and broke the back of the union. So it's funny because a lot of these old white radical union folks in our, well, they're cynical now, but they used to be radical in the 80s. These old, you know, white professors who are the, 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 the old staunch union folk remember that it was the black administration that came in in the 80s and broke the labor movement. So it's just so funny how diversity can be used fundamentally as an anti-labor administrative body. So that's all. Yeah, that is a lot of, I'm chewing on a lot of it, but I think that the, um, I think something that interests me too about that is um, what kind of what I talked about a little bit at the beginning, which is what are the limits of a conversation about diversity in a neoliberal institution, but really anywhere, which is that the bottom never needs to be diversified, right? So uh, for instance, just even on the Newark campus, um, if you go into the Starbucks tomorrow and try to argue for or try to propose like a diversity initiative, all of the black women working there who are, it is only black women working in there for minimum wage would say, diversify us how, right? So a lot of the diverse, the diversity conversation is limited, I think, to the middle and uh, to the managerial and above classes, right? That becomes a project of that. And I think that one of the reasons that, um, again, that the focus becomes diversity and not anti-racism, that the focus becomes diversity and, and the rising of the ladder being the new face, changing the colors of the faces above is because you can't, if we're gonna talk about justice, 
closer to the bottom, it can't be a talking point. It's already diversified. It's already there. And so it's, um, I think that that's one of the major challenges around it. And I think that's especially a big one at Rutgers Newark because so many, as we expand, as we're bringing in more students who are from Newark, born in Newark, born poor, raised poor, that we're talking about a initiative that does not apply to any of their friends or family. It means, it means kind of bringing them out of, of their, um, out of their, their place and fighting for things in a place that they, that they are just trying to get into. Fighting for diversity in the managerial class is not where they are now. It's fighting for them to get to there and then everyone else with them is left behind. So I think that that's part of one of the things that inspired our conversation. Um, and I would love to, to talk a little bit more about the relationship between ECC and Newark and, Ruck and Rutgers Newark because they're side by side, they're basically connected. And I remember even my students early on saying things like, okay, well, I moved from ECC to Rutgers Newark and they're like, now I'm trying to transfer to Rutgers New Brunswick. Like now that's the next thing. And I think part of, I think that's really bound up in calling us a diversity laboratory as, as Bob Barchi once did and, and really bound up in moving up, becoming the diverse face in the next round. But that does nothing, nothing about the structures of racism for, for the people living in the city. Um, and then too, I, I really wish we had someone from Camden here too, because I think people in Camden could talk a lot about this and, and they have, they've, they've had their a freedom school about the situation in Camden. But, but I mean, I think Bob Barchi called them the service campus. I think that was theirs. So we're the laboratory for diversity. They're the service campus, New Brunswick's the flagship. And yet there's a way that that diversity label is being employed both racistly and also uh, as a solution to racism in a way that I, I'm, I'm concerned about. Oh yeah, and Jim Brown is here and he is, he is from Camden. He could, he could tell us a lot about, about some of the problems in Camden. Um, any more thoughts from people on, along those lines? Has, for, for people who have been undergrads, did you understand or feel a relationship to people coming in and out of Essex County College? I mean, my, my, so while I was at um, Rutgers Newark, my brother was going at, um, to uh, um, 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 Essex County. Um, otherwise, I, I not really in, um, um, I don't think there was a, I, I taught, I, I think I TA'd a class once while I was at Rutgers Newark where I had a student from um, Essex uh, County College, but um, I, I think I had a couple of classmates also who have taken um, coursework there, which I which I think is this, was a sort of a standard trajectory, right? People take some initial coursework there and then come over to um, 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 uh, Rutgers, right? And I, I think precisely because um, it's it's a much more um, um, financially sensible thing to do, right? Um, which is I think part of this whole problem, right? Um, uh, this, yeah. But yeah, that was my that was essentially the sort of experience I had with uh, regarding that relationship. There's also this. There's a sort of a someone asked earlier about the, the whole a, um, honors college HLC thing, and I just wanted to clarify that. So I'm not trying to beat on the HLC here. And I think um, a warning that so Adi actually mentioned in conversations we've had before is that this is precisely what the what the problem, right? It's pitting um, um, people against each other, right? And I, I, I think the HLC is an awesome initiative, right? I, while I was there, I thought it was an interesting thing. However, right, I think the, the, the precise nature of the problem is that uh, this, sort of a zero sum game the administration wants to make the situation is not act the, the actual situation of it now. Um, so just wanted to clarify that and put some sort of um, context in that discussion. Hey, so could you please repeat the question just one more time? Um, just as if people had a sense who were undergraduate students of of a relationship between Essex County College and 
and Rutgers Newark, but also like, where does that fit into the context of diversity, right? Because uh, as Margaret was laying out, like a conversation about diversity of student body at Essex County College is not, it's not really gonna go anywhere um, because that it's not a school that needs to diversify or it's not a school whose project was that um, to begin with. So, so where, where now do we see the relationship between Essex County College and Rutgers Newark in terms of diversity, or at least how you've experienced it, if there is one? Um, I would say the process is like kind of like grooming, if that makes sense. Um, like if you're from Newark, I will pay your tuition like free for two years. Um, and hold on, can you come back to me? I'll be happy to answer, but yeah, some, my yeah, thoughts. no worries. No worries, gather your thoughts. I mean, maybe we could talk a little bit more because I'm, I'm also seeing a little bit in the comments too, like some of the pushback. And I think that's part of the issue because one reason that people are really tentative to have this conversation is not because we don't necessarily see, see how diversity is touted. Um, like one thing I've also noticed, and I'm not sure if I mentioned already, but around uh, Paul Robeson, right? Paul Robeson is a figure to Rutgers and to Rutgers Newark in particular. Um, we have a library named after him, and there's a way that he has been sort of subsumed or absorbed into a more um, cheery uh, or, I guess, uh, shallow um, concept of diversity than the things that he really stood for, which would be anti-racist fight back and left internationalism, right? Like those those are the things that get elided in when he becomes just a example of diversity or a figure of diversity. And uh, yeah, there's, I, I, I wanna, I would love to talk about him specifically, but, but if there's anything else anyone can think of along those lines, your own examples of that um, or questions you've had about um, even as a student, like I remember the first time someone called me diverse, like, your diverse, your diversity <laughs> hire, or your diverse, your diverse person, and I'm like me myself. I am diverse, or I represent something in a larger narrative. Maybe especially the students could talk a little bit about that. Like, are am am I? If I'm diverse, what does that mean, and what does it? What can't it mean? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? I have a question. I'm a student of Rutgers Newark. I'm an undergraduate. Um, and my question is, I understand the purpose of this meeting. However, the issue is a lot more broad than, than what it, it seems to be. But this is a good cause. This is a good thing to pay attention to because as you mentioned before, it is not something that I should just take action right now. This is something that is gonna affect future generations. And this is the reason why I'm attending tonight. However, I don't, I understood the professor. I understand what you're saying, but I feel like students have a big misconception and that does not help. So information is to go past, information is to pass around a lot more, but there is something around in Rutgers that doesn't let it, like there is no time for these type of things. Students are not encouraged to talk about these type of things, regardless or, or background, because it's very obvious. It's, it's, it's something that I, I come from a, from a Hispanic community, politics is something you should not talk about or religion or religion because it's an issue. But in this type of matter, it's a lot more broader than that. So it's like, what's the step to take? Right. No, I, I, I really appreciate that because that's also uh, where we're going with this conversation, which is 
uh, a first step in that direction, um, getting a platform. And also the biggest thing we wanted to do, which, which um, it was not so much the case when we were first meeting to uh, organize around Professor Abbas's situation. And part of why Professor Abbas's situation is able to happen is because of that culture of silence, right? That you, this is a touchy subject. This is a difficult subject to engage in. And like I said, precisely because we are doing the work and we, we do want resources and we do want those things, but how do we get those resources without bailing PSE and G out of um, their, their racist practices? How do we get, how do we organize um, without it being taken over by the corporate university for its own profit gains? How do we fight racism without getting sucked into a shallower diversity narrative? Um, one thing I would say as an example is, and I would say one space that it can happen in is in the classroom. Um, for me, for Sarah, for Nuhu, like, I mean, I've TA'd, I think, when Sarah's in the class before, but um, we're not people who have all taken a bunch of classes together. We're not people who were all even in the same club at the university. Um, we are connected through a classroom space that moved beyond actually space and time. We all had contact with the same professor who encouraged us and fostered us in the same way and fostered our politics and the development of our politics in a particular way. And the development of one, the classroom as a, as a place things can happen, um, as a place where we can think and learn about this. Oh, am I frozen? You're frozen, but we can hear. Yes, there is something happening. I'm not sure I was not able Hello? to hear that part. I at least can hear you, although you're frozen. So, um, I mean, yeah. Manu, would you like to come in here? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, so I, I don't really have much to add to um, what um, so he was saying. I, I, so something we've actually talked about in, in some of the discussions we, we've had is, uh, I, and I think this relates to the, the question, at, at least as far as I understand it, is that there's a sort of a, and this is my experience while I was at um, um, uh, Rutgers, there's sort of an anti-intellectualism around the campus. And I, I, I think it, this, this is also tied to the whole, I know I'm bringing about the uh, honors college issue very, very much, but I, I think it's, it's just one large complex web of issues that are just intricately tied into each other. But um, yeah, there's a, there's this, the honors college was, as I mentioned earlier, right, for me, a sort of a light in what it was at um, um, uh, uh, Rutgers. I, I, I grew up in West Africa thinking going into academia was not something I even considered until I came to Rutgers and met particular professors like Professor Abbas and um, other professors like Brian Murphy, who was actually in charge of the Honors College while I was there. Um, part of what has happened recently is this people like Brian Murphy have been removed from the helm of the Honors College and it's now not, it, it's, I guess, slowly being dismantled. And that's that was one of the bulwarks of like uh, sort of an intellectual community on campus and it's just been dismantled. And, this, it's it it's been uh, um, I I don't know I think my 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 experience at Rutgers would have been very different if I was a student now um, relative to when I was actually a student right so uh, I, uh, yeah so what I one of the things I picked up in the question was the uh, the sense of a the sense that there's this, this sort of uh, anti intellectualism um, um, around the campus I I think that's exactly right and part of Part of trying to fix this issue is trying to um, fix those institutions like the Honest College, which try to resolve these issues, that try to make um, sort of a uh, sort of an intellectual community um, and better on campus. So I, I don't know if that's entirely um, irrelevant to the question, but that's I, I guess what I can add to, um, at this particular juncture. <clears throat> Um, I would like to add something. Um, with my experiences during college, I was part of this leadership society um, group. And the group consisted mostly of 
black and brown um, students. And one of the main ideas they like promoted to us, like you're a brand, act like it. And that right there um, underscores the individualism and exceptionalism that they, they promote to us. Like for example, they'll use celebrities or like this person was like you, came from nothing and blah, blah, blah. And look, they made it to be a success. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Hi, sorry, I've had to turn my video off because I have gotten the dreaded unstable connection um, warning from Zoom several times now, and then I got kicked out. Um, but yeah, I really wanna follow up with what Nuhu and, and Sam are talking about, which is, um, and what I would call the, this is what I meant by the increasingly corporate logic of diversity, right? That it, that a lot of it is about branding, a lot of it is about narrative, not so much about substance. Um, but then there's also, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's really, you've really gotten to the heart of it, like consider yourself a brand. Um, but also I think part of the anti-intellectualism, so there's a way in which some of uh, what Bob Barchi had said about Rutgers Newark being a diversity laboratory is that we have internalized that narrative, right? At Rutgers Newark, many of us have internalized that narrative, that we are some kind of experiment in diversity and that that is also the way forward. That is, the liber that is, that is a kind of liberation. And I would really, what I really want is to find ways for us to organize outside of that narrative against that narrative and and also that it's an anti anti intellectual one so um right now something i'm hearing a lot and and maybe margaret could chime in even with ecc um but there's a lot around providing students predominantly poor and black students at newark like a pathway to practical employment right like that they're and job training that we're here to job train and which means we're not here to develop their intellects we're not here to have them think or study hard about about these subjects but instead um just become i don't know the next mayor of this city and think no further right like that's that's sort of what we're trying to develop and i have a tiny example from a union action uh, that we did in the last contract campaign. Um, we did something called the food drive for grads. And we just wanted to highlight that it's really nice. You built this food pantry here um, while also arguing in a bargaining table that grads should really not have enough money to live on, right? So you've built us this, thing, this charity, which several administrators have and will continue to win awards for, right? but they won't pay us that living wage. And also you've developed a food pantry, but you are the biggest bill collector of all the students there. So I, during the Senate meeting, I asked the chancellor, you know, how she felt about that contradiction. And the answer I got was that, you know, they're developing an initiative to train the, the, the poor and colored students of Newark um, out in the fields to grow the food for the food pantry. And I immediately, I went plantation. What are we talking about here? The students are too, for, too poor to feed themselves. So out to the fields they go, sharecropping we go. Um, but there wasn't the same, and those ideas get a lot of excitement because of what they mean to diversity, what they mean to the narrative diversity. But what doesn't get excitement is I um, is developing and seeing the students as intellectuals, as future scholars, as, um, as, as here looking for knowledge first and foremost. Instead, they're here looking for an opportunity to be the diverse face of the next corporation and they need to brand themselves and or get practical job training. And as much as that is sold under a diversity thing, I think it's fundamentally racist. Right? It's a fundamentally racist idea. And it's hard to be able to call it that because especially when we have so much pushback from the right around diversity, it becomes hard to pick it apart from the left. 
or to challenge it from the left. And that's, uh, that's another project of this, this conversation. But I would like to, uh, I think we're actually, I don't know if, if Manu is looking at it, but I think we're closing in on time here. Um, so we might need to wrap up, but I just wanted to ask the participants, I think we lost Nuhu too, um, if they have anything else that they wanted to add to this conversation uh, as in sort of in way of closing. I didn't, mm -hmm. but I wanted to hear more from the participants. I had no idea there's so many people on this call. It's, it's over 40 people. Um, uh, just is it is it is the whole thing going to be over soon, or, or or is just this part of it over? Um, I I mean the whole thing's going to wrap up soon. But we could we could move this and take sort of questions or discussion points from the audience. We could do that. So maybe what we can do is unhighlight. Um, our guests and just open it up to a conversation. We have, I think we have the link uh, active till 8.30. Um, one thing I, I wonder uh, whether we wanna do is do we wanna keep recording or do we want to um, <clears throat> to move this to a, a, you know, um, a conversation among attendees specifically? Um, I mean, I think, uh, Manu, if you had closing remarks that you wanted to make, we could do those and then move it to the conversation. Um, I think uh, I, it, I think it just depends how the Freedom School generally operates, if they record the conversation or not, or the questions or not. I So a lot of what I had planned to say at the end, I said at the beginning, I actually, I got an email uh, from Vijay also uh, during our conversation. <laughs> he was deeply apologetic. He was, um, he's on the ground. He had landed in Buenos Aires and was uh, on the ground between, um, between there and um, La Plata and didn't have reception. Um, so um, a lot of what I said, you know, at the beginning was, was sort of where I wanted to, to sort of close things. But I, you know, I will say the union action isn't the only thing that's going to fix this problem. It cuts deep as our participants have discussed and, um, and it's going to take nothing short of, of large scale political action, um, both in and outside um, the sort of structures of union organization. Um, but union organization can be one tool that we can draw on and should draw on. Um, and so, um, you know, for those in the Rutgers community here, um, you know, I just want to encourage you to, to look very seriously at what the campaign um, contract demands are. Think about, you know, whether they're in service of the liberation of those whom Du Bois called darker people um, or not. Um, and uh, as you see them in alignment with a radical politics that you can get behind, um, support them, support the union as one facet, um, as one sort of uh, tool in this in this ongoing fight. Um, so with that, I will um, I will uh, silence my microphone. And um, so Elia, do you want to call on people whose hands are raised? Is that cool? Um, I can, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I just need a view where I can kind of see people. I don't, we didn't take as far as I can see a stack. Um, yeah, Sherry, do we generally stop recording for this part of it? Yeah, okay, so we can stop recording now.